will recognize if you whistle a tune, if you have a live version of it and so forth. And, and in that respect, this goes back to what we were talking about with the black box system. I'm exaggerating here, but these deep learning systems, they're black boxes, they don't really care what you're putting into them. It could be pixels from images of birds, it could be stereo audio from compact disc, it doesn't matter. You just put it in there and you coerce it into outputting a certain answer for certain examples. It could be audio, it could be video, whatever, it does the same thing. So this technique, deep learning, is kind of eating the world right now modulo these issues that that we were discussing before that it's it does have some drawbacks you know autonomous cars are a big issue right now and, and supposedly the direction that the automobile the vehicle world is moving in and 5g is supposed to make it all possible can you tell us what you think um yeah, so I'm very skeptical about self-driving cars, and I consider myself an expert. <laughs> um, so I, I would not want to get in one anytime soon. Right. Um, I think, now to be clear, self-driving cars make use of every sensor you can imagine. Vision is just part of it. Um, so they're using LiDAR, and uh, even, you know, in the sense that they use computer vision, it's a lot more than just frontal facing cameras. They're pointing every direction. Um, but I mean, just walk around Manhattan or just walk around anywhere. And it's just so many unpredictable things are happening. Um, and there's a lot of nonverbal communication that happens between drivers that I'm not saying it's unknowable. I'm sure that with enough data, eventually you could figure this out. But just things like lane merging and just getting onto a freeway, there, there's often you know maybe a second of, of doubt when it's happening. Maybe a car will hit me. I don't know, but I'm just gonna pull out. And I don't think computer you know if the computer system is driving, it needs to be auditable. There has to be some kind of clear explanation for why it's making these decisions that it is. So I think um, one big benefit in the case of self-driving cars is that there is no shortage of simulation data that we can get. It's a little bit analogous to flight simulators, but it's now commonplace that Google Street View style imagery is available everywhere. You can build pretty realistic simulations of very complicated neighborhoods. You can study the way cars move around pedestrians, obstacles in the road. So you can certainly build simulations that would allow self-driving cars to have done, let's say, millions of miles of testing before you get into it. But I, it's, I guess it's not the technical issues I'm worried about, because if you name a problem, pedestrian detection, obstacle avoidance, early braking, I can picture the engineering solution that will solve it. But we are the enemy. We are horrible. We're, I mean, it's, the, it's the humans that are the problem. And I think that if you get to a point where you're somehow meeting in the middle and local governments change the way that traffic is conducted and that the self-driving cars are actually sort of pushing back on the way that, that traffic, uh, that you know, stop signs work, crossings and stuff, then you know if that happens where policy starts changing okay of course if you got special lanes if you have some kind of beacons put into the street but that's not what the self-driving car companies are talking about right now they're talking about just charging in to this messy middle right now where most cars are driven by humans and then you're just going to put some self-driving car in there so i think if you look at lessons of, of technology um, uh, in, in history, before these became popular, there was something called the Palm Pilot. Who remembers that thing? Yeah. So with the Palm Pilot, one thing that, that counted as innovation in the case of Palm Pilot was you, you could do handwriting on it, but it wasn't normal writing. It was his own special alphabet. So you already, you all know how to write handwriting, but no, 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 you had to change the way you wrote, like the K, was weird looking, it looked like an alpha, right? So you have to remember that that's how a K looks, but if you do that, 
then it gets it right every time. So I think that that's just one of those things that happens over and over in technology is that the companies just come out saying AI is going to solve everything and then like cities invest in it and big companies are formed and then they say wait a minute this is really hard can, can you all change everything you're doing and then it will work and then you're kind of you can't turn back at that point. I'm clearly editorializing here, but uh, that's my take on that. Other questions? Over here. Hello. Uh, just listening to you, it scares hell out of me when I think of the application to medicine by the diagnosis of treatment. It's like the automobile coming out into traffic. And I just don't know where it's heading, because obviously if you make a mistake, it could be quite dangerous. Yeah. Yeah, th this, I'm glad you asked about the medical domain, and, and it's not an accident that I'm working with citizen science groups, because they are wonderful collaborators. These are groups of citizen scientists and professional scientists that want to share this information with the world and make it as publicly accessible as possible. And they are committed to explainability, interpretability. They want to advance science. They want to make it so that someday anyone who takes a picture that might include an endangered species, that some beacon would get sent out and sent to the right person and that that you would discover something about um, species migration, endangered species, and so forth, that everyone sub sort of contributes to that sort of thing. This is not how it is with medicine right now. The, there are so many siloed operations, and I mean, it's sort of a, a cliche to say we could cure cancer if everyone would just share information. Of course, it's not that simple, but it's the kind of thing where um, I get asked a lot, why don't you apply this to uh, dermatology? You could look at precancerous skin moles. You could look at so many different, like retinal, uh, diabetic retinopathy and so on. It's the same kind of thing. You could do everything we see here, but it requires experts to get together and to have large communities that are committed to sharing the data and explaining the results and being frank about failures and so forth. And the medical informatics community is not ready to do that. And, and so I want to get to the point, it's kind of an ulterior motive I have. I have little kids, three and one year old. And I think when they're older, this stuff is going to work so well. I mean, it's just the kind of thing they'll just take for granted like a calculator on their phone. And I want that generation to say, wait a minute, if this is possible, why in the world did we not catch dad's skin mole earlier? And, and then at some point we'll just run out of answers because it, it will be 100% possible if people would just coordinate on it. But right now it's just happening in all these little siloed operations. And if something weird happens like we were discussing before, a misdiagnosis, strange confusions, and stuff, they just won't talk about it because you know the shareholders will go crazy right there's no money to be made in this thing right and and yet the the volunteers just line up in the tens of thousands to click on examples to train this thing so you, you hit on something that i find quite frustrating <laughs> are we doing for time maybe oh, i can take two more two more okay here's your oh my side of the room thank you a uh, short question about the trend in aerial imagery and using uh, deep learning and image recognition for satellite imagery, drone imagery, general um, reflection of yours. And uh, I guess deeper question is, you know, driverless cars have been around for some time and like they're, they're more advancement. And if you take, I mean, yes, there's differences and there's a lot of challenges, but essentially it's always the same. It's, you know, vehicle, this is a pedestrian vehicle, and satellites and Earth imageries, just unknown world. What do you think would be the trend where it's going? 
Okay, so the first question was, have I worked on on? No, like just general as a reflection on the industry and the oh. wide industry and using image recognition and that. What's challenges? What do you think yeah. the future is? Um. So, in the case of so there's satellite imagery, aerial imagery, and, and street view. These are like three different ways of looking at everything on Earth. And there are many, many startup companies that are trying to mine that information for everything. So a lot of hedge funds actually have computer vision teams studying shipping yards, oil storage tanks, um, just looking at car dealer, uh, like inventory of cars, like everything that's just visible from the sky. Um, they're using computer vision to just produce quantitative measures and it's really not published. It's not in the public domain. I don't know what's happening there, but just anecdotally, it seems like whatever you're seeing here is being applied hand over fist to the to aerial and, and satellite imagery. It has obvious defense applications that I'm sure are being pursued as well. Second thing was... Uh well, not just general reflection. I didn't have any specific. Oh. Like, what you think about where, where, how long would it take? You know, like driverless cars. What is like five years? Or yeah. If not, they building and they still even not close. And yesterday, Microsoft announced, for example, the funds for humanitarian disaster response for forty million dollars um, that they will be building the application for like the flood protection. Yeah. But let's say in in driverless cars, there is a simulation data. It's more or less. Or have a more or less data that is sensible um, to build anything. Yeah, I think again in, in the case of um, of the self driving cars, I just I mean frankly I don't think it will ever happen um, in its current form. So I, as I mentioned before, I think what will happen is that society will buckle under the pressure and actually change our transportation infrastructure, and then regular human drivers will just get edged out of the system because they are considered too dangerous. So I, I, that's my prediction of, of what will happen. Last question. You may want to pass on this, but um, in three minutes or less, can you demystify any portion of that algorithm on the, uh, on the screen? Sure. Um, so, the, I mentioned that, the, that what's happening is that you're selecting questions that maximize expected information gain. So that term is something that comes from information theory, but here's a way to think about it. Let's say you have an, an urn and you, have, you fill it with ping pong balls and each ping pong ball has a question written on it. And uh, the question might be, is the bill black? And another ball in the urn says, are the feet white? And, and another one says, um, are the wing tips red? All right, so there's 300 of these ping pong balls inside this urn. Now, if I haven't even looked at the image of the bird, I could just play a game of 20 questions with you and reach into the urn and take out a ball and read a question. So we could just be on a long road trip, passing time. You think of a bird, I reach into the urn, and I ask you a question, are the eyes black? So that thing, line three, with the maximum over K of that thing, that's the process of selecting a ball to ask a question. But the way I just did it was random. I just reached in there and pulled out any ping pong ball, and I read the question to you. Are the eyes black? And then you say yes or no, right? And that, in my mind, narrows down the set of possible birds. And then I reach into the urn again and I pull out another ball and I ask a question. So that would be the, the random way of doing it. But what's actually happening in that equation that has that eye and all those symbols inside it is that it isn't doing it at random. The computer looked at the image and produced that bar chart, that thing at the top left, P of C given X, something called posterior probability. It's the probability that the bird is in class C given what you observe X. That thing is not flat. 